he could have used resources in community. Um, and so it showed their, um, the problems of their priorities. Um, so um, now we're um, at a point after having gone through the year of 2016 of um, really pushing for um, a reimagining, the city pushed for a reimagining what that project could look like. Um, we disrupted that project, that, that, that task force over and over again to push for it to prioritize alternatives. Um, and um, there are different ways in which um, we can make that go. Um, there is still the push to close 850 Bryant. Since we don't have a new jail, we do still need to get rid of the old jail. Um, and um, there, and then there, it, there is the problem of the streams of people that are being pushed into the jail. Um, so connecting with, we're working to connect with um, fights against, um, fights for bail reform, um, whether that be through people who are working on um, the defense work um, uh, and then outreach around the national, statewide, and local work to um, engage in bail reform. Um, and um, to really, really think about and push around um, the arrests and prosecutions of people in um, of, of poor people, of black and brown people um, in San Francisco um, and attack things like gang injunctions, um, some of the pivots around broken windows, policing, and policing of bicycle theft, um, and uh, all the while monitoring these, um, how the sheriff is moving, because like, um, she still does have plans around building a jail, um, and then there is the specter of a mental health jail that is coming back. So um, the fight goes on. Um, so I'm now going to pass it off um, to Jose, who's going to talk a little bit um, about um, the fight against uh, gang injunctions in San Francisco um, as a, like a way to, to engage in a chokehold uh, around the system of policing and um, people being ported to, to the jail system. And you, uh, with, um, so, uh, with the gang injunctions in San Francisco, um, they've been in place in San Francisco for 10 years now. Um, the city attorney started pursuing this in, in 2006. Uh, in 2008, you know, he, he named, uh, uh, he got his injunction out in the Bayview, targeted the Oakdale, uh, quote unquote, the alleged gang, Oakdale uh, mob. Uh, everyone named on the first injunction was black. Uh, to date, at every single person on the injunction, 145 people are uh, black or brown. Uh, the city attorney's office targeted four neighborhoods. Uh, and mind you, this is 10 years ago uh, when this started. The neighborhoods were uh, Bayview, Hunters Point, uh, Western Edition, Fillmore, uh, the Mission District, the district we're in right now, uh, and Vis Visitation Valley, the last one in 2011. Uh, and we've seen uh, throughout the 10, the 10 years that I'm talking about uh, mass displacement of black and brown folks in these neighborhoods, uh, and that's not a coincidence. Um, so we started this back in uh, October, um, and I, I should mention that this is a renewed campaign, uh, because I do want to shout out the uh, organizations and the folks uh, that fought this back 10 years ago, um, as it was happening, as it was taking place, as they were getting hit. Uh, but 10 years, uh, now 10 years later, uh, in October of last year, we uh, held a community meeting in the Tenderloin, a community discussion. We invited the public defender's office to come talk. Uh, what is a gang injunction? Uh, what does it look like? Uh, how does it impact our communities? Uh, we had a good turnout. Uh, from that meeting, uh, we decided to, uh, to start organizing around it and, and really do some heavy research into it because now uh, we have the benefit of looking 10 years down the line and say this, this didn't work. This is a ineffective. This was a, a failed experiment. This was blatantly racist. Uh, it mirrors uh, the uh, post-Civil War uh, uh, black codes of the South uh, that criminalized uh, black men, uh, you know, for uh, normal behavior. As it, it's essentially what it is. Um, so we, uh, uh, you know, are pushing really hard. Um, there is no real specific organization taking this on. It's just 
you know, folks meeting together, um, you know, on their own time. Uh, we definitely have support from organizations, but it's just, you know, and so anyone in here is welcome, you know, to join us, to meet us. Um, you know, we usually meet Thursdays, uh, every first Thursday of the month. Uh, a number of things that are happening with the injunctions is, um, uh, one is uh, we got a, a, a big uh, a reentry council uh, uh, hearing, not hearing, uh, discussion, uh, and we're going to push for the reentry council to send a letter to the city attorney, Dennis Herrera, uh, to end these injunctions. Um, now, the city attorney has been very defiant. Uh, one of the things that we have found with these injunctions and looking back is that there are uh, to date deceased black and brown men on that list. Uh, so if you think about it, if you really process it, it, what that means for San Francisco is San Francisco has a permanent, a permanent registry for black and brown men. Uh, and men on, black and brown men are, are deceased on there and it's still on there. Uh, one of those men on there, uh, on the injunction, whose name is still on there uh, and on the city attorney's office for the world to see, uh, is, you know, we just talked about Mario Woods. Uh, you know, you think about that, uh, how egregious, how insulting uh, that is for the city attorney to have that. Uh, we're going to call them out uh, on the next reentry uh, re council meeting, uh, April 26th, uh, 150 Golden Gate, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, community will have an opportunity to uh, do public comment, uh, uh, and we're really going to ask the reentry council to send a letter to the city attorney. Uh, we also have uh, another meeting coming up, big hearing. Um, it's essential, it is uh, imperative that the community shows up uh, June 13th, uh, Board of Supervisors hearing, uh, room 263 at 4 p.m. Uh, it is imperative that the community mobilize around us. Hi, um, oh, a louder than expected. Um, so yeah, so I'm here representing Do No Harm Coalition today. Um, just so you all know, my, my day job is actually teaching at San Francisco State University, but I'm a member of Do No Harm. Um, so and the, the core issue that we really have been organizing around so far is around police violence. Um, and the reason for that is, um, you know, our, the goal of our organization is to accompany community members that have been affected by state violence and work together in a struggle for dignity and rights. And what we see uh, the communities that we're connected to in San Francisco fighting for is around this issue. Uh, the, the groups we've been most connected to are um, those just uh, those groups that are fighting for justice, um, such as justice, um, the individuals and, and folks uh, fighting for justice for Mario Woods and um, Luis Gangora, uh, Pat, and and so forth. Um, and one of the reasons that we feel like this is just a really important issue, aside from it being where the energy is, is that um, we know that police violence has a huge impact on health. So and and do no harm is a group of. Uh, medical students, doctors, healers, activists, uh, but mostly folks focused on health. So we see, you know, we see the trauma, the mental health impacts. Um, we also see the injuries and deaths. All these things are obviously very closely related to health. Um, so some of the major projects that we're working on right now, and, and one that I'll, I'll speak to more so, is um, one's called the Justice Study which is a survey that's um, been designed um, to help us better understand the connections between policing and police violence and health. Um, the study actually came about because um, folks that were organizing for justice of Mario Woods um, actually asked that we document what are the health effects, and, and in particular, what are the health effects when there's a killing but there's no justice served. So that's really the goal of our of our work is to look into that, um, you know, and and the and the purpose of doing that, of course, is to respond to the community's needs. But also, we want we want to have data that can be used by groups um, who are advocating for all these things. Like, um, you know, such a great example Woods gave of of showing how Mario Woods' death was a result of the way that our priorities are focused on policing and prisons and not on. Um, what communities really need. So we want to be able to have more data that gives weight to those arguments. Um, you know, just to mention quickly, a couple other initiatives that I know um, other folks are working on are um, there's a No Justice, No Deal initiative where um, uh, there's an effort to make sure that contracts with police, um, you know, are are fair, you know, fair in the sense that um, 
police are not able to go outside of you know what the the various regulatory um, rules that are supposed to guide them. You know, and my understanding is that there are um, there's a contract that you know could kind of circumvent some of the rules that we put in place. So uh, so I know there are mem other members that are working more in that. Um, and also fighting against the ballot that um, is about tasers that would give police more authority to use tasers. Um, lastly, the other um, the other uh, initiative that I wanted to mention is um, some work I've done outside of the Do No Harm Coalition. So this is a project that is actually endorsed by Do No Harm, but um, but I've been working with a group of public health workers to um, to push. The, to kind of raise the awareness of policing as a public health issue uh, within uh, the public health community. So, and specifically at the American Public Health Association, which is the largest association, a professional association of public health workers. So for the last couple of years, we've been um, pushing a statement to be adopted by this body um, that, you know, recognizes that this is not a bad apples issue. Um, it's actually, you know, there's historical roots of policing, like this exactly what um, Woods was saying in terms of, you know, the system is not broken. This is how the system is designed to work. Um, and so as a result, the, the kinds of things that we're um, demanding in this statement is that we, um, just as we see on this wall, you know, we um, shift funding away from policing and into investing in communities whether that be through restorative justice um, or um, you know, housing, social services, et cetera. So that's one of our big, uh, our big asks. And also decriminalization. You know, um, I see also some, some things around us about criminalization of homelessness. Um, we're also very concerned about criminalization of sex work, drug use, et cetera. Um, all these um, issues are, could be seen as health issues and, and maybe not even at all. I mean, I think sex work is also a, an occupation that we don't need to criminalize at all, but, um, but these, are, um, these are the kinds of things that the police in, in prisons should have nothing to do with. Um, so yeah, so, so those are some of the main things that we're, we're organizing for, but it's been a fight. Unfortunately, public health workers tend to go to the same kind of reforms um, that most people do, which is saying, um,